Smart Home HQ. This is episode number 34. You can find the show notes online at smarthomehq.net slash 034. International Podcast Day is September 30th, and you can help spread the word. International Podcast Day is dedicated to promoting podcasting worldwide. You may be asking, what can I do to get involved? It's pretty simple. First, head over to internationalpodcastday.com and check the suggestions. Second, use hashtag podcast day to join in the conversation. Remember September 30th. Now, let's start the conversation. Welcome back again for another fine episode of the Smart Home HQ podcast, the podcast that tries to make your home a, a little smarter each time. Well, that's what I'm trying to do, and uh, we can do it together as a community as well. Uh, I want to thank everybody for all the feedback and questions and comments and things like that that you guys send in all the time. It's yeah, it's great. I, I enjoy reading through it. I enjoy responding to it all. Um, and you know, it's tons and tons of fun. Well, this has been a pretty busy uh, last couple of weeks, I think. A lot of exciting things have come out. Uh, this first off being, you know, the Smart Things version 2 is finally up for pre-order. It is supposed to ship sometime in September. I kind of give that a little floating window there, but considering they've made this much of an announcement and they've put the pre-orders out, you know, let's, I'm going to be positive. We're going to see this ship out in September. I've pre-ordered mine. Uh, I do. I did send in some questions though, because I'm a little concerned uh, on the lack of specs that was listed on that site, what all included and things like that. So right now you're kind of looking at Zigbee, Z-Wave, and IP, right? But what about HomeKit and um, you know Bluetooth was supposed to be a big one that was in there. Any other threaded protocols or anything like that that it may support? I got a response and they said that uh, more information's uh, coming out soon. So they may. Uh, be getting ready to, uh, you know, ship that stuff or getting ready to send it out, but they're taking the pre-orders, but they may behind the scenes, you know, still trying to work on a few things to get that cleaned up a little bit. And it's very possible that the hardware is going to ship with it for those features, but um, not activate until later with a, you know, software update or firmware update. So, you know, that's pretty exciting. You do have a couple options of pre-ordering this if you want. So you can go to um, Smart Things directly and pre-order it. Uh, you can use your uh, Amazon account and uh, go to Amazon.com and pre-order it. However you feel comfortable. If uh, you want to, uh, don't mind using some of the referral links that I've set up on the site. Um, you can go to the show notes for today, and there is a blog post, a link to a blog post that I did earlier when this first came up, and there's some links in there. I've completely marked it as a referral link for smart things as a website a referral link to amazon and if you don't want a referral link at all just go to shop that shop dot smart things dot com and you can buy straight from there without any referrals but yeah so that's really interesting we've been waiting for this for a while if you're not really sure what i'm talking about with the smart things um, version 2 hub maybe you haven't listened to a lot of the uh, older podcasts that i talked about it or you're not really sure what the big deal of it is anyway, well, um, the biggest deal about this, other than those other protocols that I just mentioned that it's hopefully going to support, is the local processing. SmartThings Hub right now is a cloud hub. Everything that's going on is actually being the CPU, the processor, all the uh, decision-making is actually going on on Amazon's, um, yeah, it's Amazon hosted, but on SmartThings um, cloud infrastructure. Their servers are doing all your processing and sending the commands back to the hub, and then tell, the hub then tells the devices in your home uh, what to do, right? So if your internet goes out, nothing's happening. You're, there's no communication with the, the central cloud, the brain. You know, there's nothing going on in your house. Your, your routines, your relays, your scenes, all that stuff just fails to work um, until the cloud's restored. 
on the other hand, all of it fails to work until the clouds are stored. And then sometimes it catches up on all those things that it missed uh, all at once. So I've seen that happen several times. It's really freaky when your lights start flickering really, really fast. So, um, so yeah, the, the new version two hub is supposed to have local processing. It's called the local app engine and it will process, um, you know, all those commands locally should respond much, much faster than what, the way it did uh, when it was all cloud hosted. And it, uh, you know, if the internet goes out, it's supposed to still work. It also sh uh, is supposed to have a battery. So if the internet goes out, the, the hub, uh, the internet and power goes out, you should be in good shape. And uh, it has a USB hub on it, so, uh, USB port, sorry, that you sh you're, uh, you can put in a cellular card and uh, that will have cellular backup if your internet goes out. I did have questions on that too, because a lot of devices like that in the, you know, there's a cradle point router. It's a home or RV or business router that has those USB ports in it as well. Um, that you're supposed to be able to plug uh, cellular cards in or cellular dongles um, or Wi-Fi hotspots or whatever you want to call them. Um, you're supposed to be able to plug into that and it, it'll connect and, and get online. But in my experience in the past, it's only as good as the drivers and support the router or hub has for those individual cards. So smart things is now going to have to keep up on all the latest and greatest of those USB dongles that comes out. So they make sure everyone's compatible, which I'm not really concerned about that. To be honest with you, is it possible that the manufacturers could come out with a, a generic driver since the last time I messed with it? And now all cards would, should work. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty possible. Um, it's highly unlikely that they'd all agree to do that, but uh, it's, it's very possible. Um, with that though, smart things has taken, um, really quick to feedback and requests that it's received on its community boards and they've implemented support for new hardware, and new devices pretty darn quick. So I don't see that as being a problem with those cellular cards. It's not going to be a SIM card slot built in. It's going to be a USB port. So you do ha have to have the actual USB dongle, um, or the, my, my fi high Wi-Fi hotspots that have the USB cord. A lot of those are supported on, on devices like this. So you actually do have to plug a device into it and dedicate that to being your cellular backup. Now you don't have to do that. Um, you know, you're probably still not going to be using the smart thing system for 911 kind of monitoring, but that is something again that they said, uh, you know, they have the premium subscription base that are coming out. I also asked about that. And, um, you know, I was given the PR stay tuned for future announcements. So we don't really know what all, uh, you know, the, the premium features are going to finally support. We know that there was claims and, and, um, theories and things like that made over the last year or so waiting for this. And, you know, it's, it's best just to wait and see what they announce and we'll see what happens with it. But yeah, version two local hub processing. And now if you're an existing smart things customer, you should have got an email with an invitation to purchase or pre-order the hub and a coupon code to get a very attractive discount on your hub upgrade. I, uh, I would definitely recommend you look for that if you are an existing SmartThings subscriber and use it because it is a pretty nice price off the uh, what they're retailing it for. And uh, as much as I would like you to order through the referral links or pick up another one, I would much rather you save all that money and uh, get you a nice discount on your new hub. That said, part of the disclaimer or the fine print or one of the things I've noticed is that it also says that your smart things version two hub will be a uh, complete new setup. You're going to get, if you pre-order the hub, you're going to get directions uh, before you get your new hub that tells you how to disassociate all your existing devices with your old hub. So you can pair them with your new hub when it shows up. So, Oh gosh, that hurts, right? Depending on how many devices that you have, you are going to have a ton of devices that you're going to have to disconnect and reconnect and reset up your rules and, and things like that. The rules part, that's my assumption since it's a brand new setup. I'm going to go with that. Could they at the last minute come up with a migration path? Uh, probably, but considering that most of these things are going to um, Zigbee and Z-Wave, they pair with the hub that they're connected to. There's not really any method built into those protocols to allow it to just seamlessly transition. 
about the only thing I would see them being able to do is somehow cloning the serial numbers and the IDs and the network tags and things like that from the old hub and put them on the new hub. But without being able to reprogram that old hub, you know, you're going to lose functionality with that because it can't, two hubs with the same serials and numbers and things like that, it's probably not going to work out too well. And I could see that carrying over and not processing rules properly and things like that, uh, unique identifiers and whatnot. So it is pretty unfortunate that you're going to have to spend uh, probably a lot of time transferring those devices over. But be with the local app processing and the better performance, I believe, you know, just take a weekend, do the migration, and you may even notice, like I have, that a lot of the things that I set up when I first joined with SmartThings and the apps and the rules have been upgraded um, drastically. A lot of things have changed in those apps since I set them up and forgot about them originally, right? So you set it up, it's working, you never go back and, you know, see if there's anything new going on, if there's any upgrades or any fixes to the code or whatnot. And I ended up originally, since I did start out early, I ended up taking a lot of the base of their code and and heavily customizing it to do exactly what I want. And now a lot of that's different now. So actually this may be a really good thing. Uh, you get in, you see, you may, you know, see that uh, the experience has been a lot, uh, streamlined a lot more. The apps and the functionality that you want is a lot easier to accomplish. It is, but be prepared to take at least a day off, you know, set a lot of time aside depending on how many devices you have because you're going to want to go through and make sure you got everything. What I would do before you trans, uh, before you hook up the new hub, you know, go old school or get your diagram, you know, at work when we do network configurations and network designs, use Visio or, um, you know, a stenciling or outlining kind of tool where you can build a network diagram. Consider your home automation a network of, of devices, which is, you know, it is just using different protocols and map that out. And, you know, I got water sensors here, 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 and these do this. I got these modes. I got these alarms. I got, you know, all these devices and create yourself a little check sheet. You want to make sure you go through and you get everything when you transfer it over and you get those rules set up exactly how you want them when you get that switched over. You don't want to find out um, that you forgot a water sensor in the basement when your sub pump or water pipe breaks or something like that. So document beforehand, get you a good outline, prepare, and uh, set some time aside. So they are supposed to send a lot of documentation, or they are supposed to send some documentation on how you can transition. If I've, I have asked if I could get the hub a little earlier so I can go through this process, and if I run into roadblocks, and I will document that, I'll talk to you guys about it, do a video about it, whatever I can do, to make this switch a little easier on you. So just prepare, know what you're getting into, and know that there's a plus side to this. If you're, Maybe you're not as geeky as me, but once you migrate over to the version 2 hub, you have a version 1 hub that you can do whatever you want with. You can take it to your office, you can take it to a family, family member, um, friends, whatever. You have a backup hub or a spare hub, second hub, another location. There's another device that you can use. You already know what the limitations and everything on it with it being cloud, but it's already on your account, and it's another hub you can use. I got my wheel spinning, and how cool would it be in your little cube at work or your office at work, whatever you have. I got a cube, but do you were... Uh, your proximity sensor, your presence sensor, your phone, whatever you have hooked up, knows you get to work, and all of a sudden your lights turn on, your fan, your little radio, or your computer boots up. I mean, you got a lot of cool things you can do and just be the envy of the office, right? Or you give it to your parents or grandparent or, you know, whoever. You can actually do something even more practical with it. But that's it. That's the version 2 hub. That was a whole lot of information about the version 2 hub. And you tell them a little excited about it. It's been pushed off for a long time, and now it's finally, you know, so close. It's almost here. You know, a couple months, not even a couple months, you know, just a month away, um, maybe a full month, you know, if it's the ship by the end of the month, but whatever. It's almost here, and uh, it's a lot of anticipation and, and a lot of anticipation. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited, right? It's, it's almost here, and... 
local processing, no more angry internet outage issues and the hub downtime and all this crazy stuff. So, you know, that's my expectation. I hope they don't, uh, hope they don't blow it. I hope it blows my expectations away. I hope it's really awesome. I completely jumped past, uh, the video that you guys heard when you are audio video, depending on what you're watching, but, uh, international podcast day is September 30th. And, uh, you know, I, I almost like to compare this or joke about it being international talk like a pirate day, but it's not, it is not it at all. International podcast day, September 30th is, uh, has been created to bring more attention to podcasting, spread the word, share a podcast, you know, start one yourself, ask people what their favorite, uh, podcast and everything is, you know, just talk to people about it. Maybe they don't even know what podcasting is. Chances are, uh, you know, if you know anybody with an iPhone, you know, they, they have an eye, if they're on the latest OS, they have a podcast app now in with the operating system. There's a ton of them available for Android, you know, Windows phone, a lot of that other stuff out there too. So computer streaming, there's a lot of options out there. A lot of people probably don't even know what a podcast is and you could take some time and let them know about it. Let them know what some of your favorite podcasts are. And maybe you, you know, you're going to add some, uh, some different content to their commute to work and home or mowing the grass or whatever they listen to music or audio books. Maybe they'll take a break and start listening to um, podcasts. So um, again, it's September 30th, uh, international podcast day. I'm going to play those that uh, sound clip or video, um, you know, on the rest of the, the podcast for September and uh, I'm going to mention it on Twitter and Facebook and things like that too. So uh, that's what that was. Um, and I hope you look out for it, you know, participate if you can. Uh, I know you, you may not be a podcaster, but if you tell somebody about it, uh, even if you give one person, that's one more person times however many active listeners there are right now, uh, it could grow um, pretty significantly. So that's uh, International Podcast Day, not International Talk Like a Pirate Day. So what else, news-wise, that's pretty interesting that's come out here this, uh, probably in this last week, with smart things? Hmm. I'm going to go with Alexa can now interact with smart things. That's right. If you have the Amazon Echo, you can now interact with your smart things hub. You can do any switch and dimmer. That's Default support light switches, switches with uh, light switches with dimmers or your Philips hues. But now you can interact with uh, the Smart Things Hub, so that's really cool. It gave it uh, before in the past it could do hue and wink and uh, the Belkin devices. So if you had hue bulbs, uh, you could you know dim them, turn them on and off. Uh, Belkin switches and things like that, you can turn those on and off as well. Well now if you have a you know your Smart Things is your primary hub. And you have switches and outlets and toggles and whatever, you know, switch or pretty much if it's, you can switch it on and off, it can control it now. It could still dim. So one thing I do want to tell you is if you already have the Philip Hue integration with SmartThings, when you pair this, you're going to want to make sure you uncheck through SmartThings that you want to control the Hue colors and dim and things like that because it's already integrated with your probably your Philips Hue Hub if you've been using that as a feature and they will show up twice so it can confuse Alexa just a little bit so you don't want to double up and uh, if you have door locks or a garage it's not really supported I did work with the smart thing support staff to come up with a walk around and I do have that in the show notes it's another blog post on the site and I'll kind of briefly go over that a little bit just so you can get an idea um, I've got a, a pretty good set of feedback from people saying that they've already got it working and uh, I, I don't know if I need to do a video on that so send me your feedback you can feedback at uh, smarthomehq.net email um, Twitter Facebook Honestly, 90% of the communication probably comes from uh, Twitter, so keep that up. Uh, Facebook, if you use it, you know, follow. Uh, go to smarthomehq.net, click on the Facebook link, and it'll take you right to the page. You can like it, you can comment, you can do whatever you want, and obviously, you can always leave a comment on the show notes as well if you go to the site, um, or if you, the blog post, you can leave comments there as well. So any of those methods would work out. More than happy to do a video. Um, but by the time I did the video, edited it out and uploaded it, 
uh, I think a lot of you uh, who are listening, uh, who are interested in it, may have already got it working. So just let me know. Uh, if Even if you find this blo- uh, this uh, podcast, you know, m- months from now, weeks from now, whatever, you know, just let me know. If it's still a uh, working method, I will definitely do a video for you. No problem at all. So there is some steps you got to do to get the initial Alexa and SmartThings linked up. I'm going to assume you already have a SmartThings application and you already have the Alexa application. And uh, SmartThings does have a quick rundown step-by-step on their blog. I did link to that from the show notes too. But basically, you got to make sure you're signed into your SmartThings app. You already have a username and a password. You're signed into your Echo app and you already have your username and password for that, which the Echo is your Amazon account and, um, you know, SmartThings, your SmartThings account. But you go into your um, Amazon Echo app, and then you need to click on the settings. And from there, you need to find the section that says Connected Home. Now, if you've already done your Philips Hue integration, you you already know where all this is, so don't worry about that. But um, under your Connected Home, there's going to be uh, device links, and then you're going to see a section that says Link with Smart Things. Right underneath that is one that says Link with Hue. I'm sorry, the link Link with Wink which, uh, you know, that's just there. You don't have to worry about it. It's not detecting a a wink system in your house. It's just there as an option. So click on the one that says link with smart things. It's going to load up a little mini web browser and you're going to be taken to the graph.api.smartthings.com website uh, and you need to log in. And it's going to ask you if you want to give permission for the Echo app to access your smart things app. And then you say yes, and it's going to say, okay, what do you want it to be able to integrate with? And you pick your hub or your home location. Chances are it's probably only going to say home unless you have multiple locations. So once you do that, you click authorize. It's going to kick you back out to the Amazon app. Don't hit discover my apps just yet. What you're going to do now is you're going to go over to your SmartThings app. Okay. And then you're going to go into the... Um, convenience section. So under your smart things app, let me open it up real quick so I can tell you for sure. Um, once you've linked Echo with smart things through the Echo app, you're going to go to the smart things app and you're going to click on uh, under your dashboard. You're going to click on convenience and then you're going to notice somewhere in your grid tile there, you're going to see an Amazon Echo icon. Click on the little gear icon above that Echo icon. So, uh, you know, if obviously you're familiar with this. If you've used SmartThings, uh, you want to find the Amazon Echo tile in your convenience section. Click on the um, the gear for the settings. And then you're going to see a My Device list. Click on that. Okay. And then you're going to be able to check all the check boxes next to the things you want the Echo to be able to control. Now, you, you could probably... Uh, the website will, when you go to authorize, it will probably ask you what you wanted to um, link there, and you can check all those. This is just an extra step because I wanted to point it out that you can get into this uh, at any time and authorize or deauthorize Echo from being able to communicate with these. And the reason I bring this up again is because if you've already integrated your Hue bulbs, you want to make sure you either take them out of the Echo app from the Hue Hub, which... Um, I would probably leave them there. I, I don't know. They Until they can start controlling color, it really doesn't matter, I guess. But you just don't want them in both places. So I like I go back in and I unchecked all the hue bulbs. So I've got my reading bulbs and my light strips and I unchecked all those in smart things and I hit done and then that and then I hit next and done again. So I'm out of the Amazon Echo and then and out of this Amazon Echo tile within smart things. <laughs> And then you go back into the Amazon Echo app. You go to your settings and you uh, tell, uh, you go into Amazon Echo settings, um, smart home or connected home devices, and then you tell it to discover devices. You could also say Alexa, discover my devices verbally, and it will do the same thing. So once you do all that, it's going to scan, it's going to find. Uh, all your smart things devices that you allowed it to integrate with, you put all those check boxes in and it's going to pull it up in your connected home section and then show under devices. 
before you get too carried away, I'd go back into the Amazon Echo app, the settings, the connected home, and look at your devices, and I would take time to set up groups. And uh, like, for example, I have all lights as a group, and I put all the light switches in there. I have all speakers for my Sonos, and I put all those in there. I have living room lights, put that in there, and I have bedroom lights, and I put those in there. Because it's so much easier to say, Alexa, turn off all the lights and have all the lights in the house shut off uh, than it is to say, Alexa, turn off kitchen light. Alexa, turn off uh, living room light. Alexa, turn off, you know, you can keep going down the list. So definitely take advantage of the group option that Alexa gives you. And that's it. Play around to your heart's content because you're going to spend probably a good hour turning on and off the lights. One, If you have kids... They're going to spend even longer turning off all on and off all the lights, and then you're going to get a little annoyed. But get past that because it's new for everybody, and it's fun. Now, if you have door locks and you have a garage door, those aren't um, compatible by default because Alexa only has support for the switching device type and the dimming device type, uh, which, <laughs> side note, because I'm really good at side notes, your siren, if you have a siren in your house, shows up as a switch. You may or may not want to allow that to be controlled if you have kids. Because once they figure out, they can tell Alexa to turn on the siren or turn off the siren. Um, it will probably get turned on quite a few times. Um, but yeah, so keep that one in mind. Anyway, back to uh, your devices. Sorry, I lost train of thought there for a minute. Uh, your garage door and your front door. So Smart Things has a little workaround that I that I talked to uh, Jesse at the Smart Things support, and we came up with a workaround here. And I g did a video of it working. I gave gave him uh, full credit. So uh, yeah, let's uh, go over that. And what it does is it allows you to open and close your garage door and your unlock and unlock uh, by creating a second device manually and using your um, Hello Home protocols or your features in SmartThings. And um, there's a few steps involved, and that's why I, I wrote it up and I you know I put it on there. SmartThings support, Jesse uh, did a really good job at writing that up, so I put it all together with the video. I want to make sure everyone gets good credit for this who, who helped with uh, you know, getting this all figured out. But you're going to need a graph.api account. And there's a lot of steps there. So uh, maybe I should probably save this and not go over every single step in this podcast because you're going to be driving and not really paying attention probably. And um, you're not going to really have it all sink in. So I don't want to information overload you a lot. I probably already did that with the uh, Echo integration. Uh, but let me go briefly um, some of the quirks with this that I found. So you're in order for, once you get your tile set up and basically, okay, quick rundown, I guess. Um, you, you're you going to create a virtual button or a virtual tile, and it's an on-off switch. And uh, what you're going to do is you're going to set it up in a way that when you say um, change the mode or hello home feature to open the garage door, it toggles that switch, and then that causes the door to unlock or unlock or the garage door to unlock or unlock. And uh, that's kind of what it integrates with. And Alexa can see that as a device type because it's a virtual switch. So she's turning on and off this virtual switch that, it, that after that virtual switch is turned on, maybe you have that set to uh, hello home mode that says open garage door. And it's so the actual mode says... When this switch is toggled on, open garage door. When this switch is toggled off, close garage door. Okay? So when you say Alexa turn on the garage door, it's flipping that virtual switch and that in turn tells smart things to open up the garage door. So then the garage door opens. And then you say Alexa turn off the garage door and it's a virtual switch hits and smart thing says close garage door. Same thing with your door lock. So it's really not um, fluent, I guess. It's it's not how you would normally want to say this out loud, but you say turn on the do front door lock or turn off the front door lock. 
And you can flip this however you want in your mind. If locked means off and open means on, you can set it that way. If, you know, vice versa as well. If on and off means whatever to you with the garage door. I mean, you're it's not set. You actually set um, it you set it up however you want in your smart things app. But here's the thing, right? Because it's a virtual switch. It's not getting live updates from the garage door or the front door lock of what the status is. It's just going to turn itself on and execute that command. If it's already been done, nothing happens. If it's not in the right mode, nothing's going to happen. So here's the example. The uh, You say, Alexa, open the garage door, it opens. Alexa, close the garage door, it closed. That virtual switch now says, I'm off, because the garage door is closed. Well, if you use your mechanical button, or your garage door open and open it, and it's not executed through Alexa, it's not executed through SmartThings as that virtual tile, now the virtual tile still says, I'm closed. But the garage door's open. So you say, Alexa, I need you to turn off, or I need you to close the garage door. Alexa says, SmartThings, I need you to turn off this switch. Smart thing says switch is already off, so I'm not doing anything. All right, so now the garage door doesn't shut. Uh, doesn't shut. So you have to either close it manually, or you have to say Alexa, turn on the garage door or open the garage door. Nothing's gonna happen because it's already open. And then you say Alexa, turn off the garage door, or close the garage door, and it will finally close because the switch now is in the correct state to make that work. So it definitely has a margin of error. It can get out of sync. That said, it's really cool, okay? <laughs> you can tell, like, oh, man, I forgot to close the garage door. Alexa, close it. Or open and then close. Uh, lock and unlock the front door. If nothing else, it's just really cool to show it off. It was a challenge that wasn't uh, supported out of the box. And you put put your mind to it, and you came up with a solution, and you got it to work. I mean, that's... The whole, that's the fun. That's one of the elements of fun anyway about being able to cu customize your own home automation system to think outside the box, to figure out a way of making something work that's not supposed to work. I guess that's why I like being an engineer so much. Um, you prevent, you're presented with a problem uh, that people can't really solve or they don't. They come to you for help to solve and you know it may have to think out of the box. You may have to say, uh, this isn't how I would normally do it, but let's work around this and see if we can get something to work Let's see if we can get it to work dependably, but if not, let's get it to work until a final solution can be put in place. I've reached out to Amazon Echo support and asked them if this is something that will be um, implemented in the future, if there's any ETA on it, and I got a generic response back that said, hey, did you know that you can integrate this with your smart things now? Here's the press release and the, um, you know, the solution for it. So I don't hold my breath on that because unless there's a direct engineer or someone in the know that you have contact with that would be able to give you any kind of response, the um, general um, call center type help desk support system with Amazon is really not going to get us very far. So unfortunately, I don't have that kind of connection yet and I don't know when this is going to happen. I asked the same question to SmartThings and uh, they said that they would love for it to happen soon, uh, but... Amazon has not announced that kind of functionality to be put into yet. So check out the show notes, go over to the blog post and go through the, watch the video. It's pretty neat. Uh, it's pretty basic. It's just, Hey, this is it working with the garage door opening and shutting and the lock opening and shutting. Um, but try it out, follow those steps and then leave some feedback. Do you need a video going through, um, how exactly it was put together? I would really I don't mind creating that for you guys. I just don't want to uh, create it if ever, if it's too late and everyone's already got it working. So just let me know. Um, I, I'll, I'll do it. So, you know, just uh, give me some feedback. Feedback at smarthomehq.net, social media. Um, e email was the first one. <laughs> social media or comments on, you know, the show notes or the blog post there. So, or even the YouTube video. Yeah, just whatever. Give me some feedback and I'll uh, I'll help you out with that. So that was the other big Amazon Alec Amazon Echo Alexa slash Smart Things integration news that, that has uh, come out, and that is uh, a lot of information. So there's probably you know nothing else I should uh, let you guys know about, right? Because I mean that's just a ton of information right there. 
now I'm going to do one better. I'm going to go back in and say there's one, maybe two more things I want to let you know about. And uh, it, it also deals with Alexa. So Alexa is uh, going to come out kind of of its shell a little bit. And you have your Echo device, and it's really cool. If you don't have one, it's really fun. Wait for a sale, but if you don't mind spending that much money on it, um, let's say around 200 bucks, give or take sales and tax and shipping and what other options there are there. Um, you can wait. Sometimes they go on sale, but maybe only two at a time if that's referring to the last Amazon Bigger Than Black Friday deal. I think they only had two Echoes that they actually had involved in those deals. It's crazy. But um, Amazon has come out with the Alexa voice service or the Amazon voice service. And that allows developers to add the Alexa voice functionality question answer kind of system into their own apps and hardware. So we may over time start seeing apps for your phone or other hardware devices that can integrate and act just like Alexa. So you, you may have the Amazon Echo right now and it is the original, but other manufacturers and developers now could come out with something else tie into other APIs, tie into, you know, their own hub with Alexa voice integration to turn it on and off. So that would be really interesting to see that come out and, uh, you know, see how far that gets. I don't know. That's, that's just another tidbit. I mean, my wife's always like me, my wife, my kids were always saying, Hey, Alexa. Oh wait, we're not at home. There's no Alexa here. How cool would that be if you could have it in your car? Just ask a question. If it was an app on your phone that you can actually integrate with and ask questions. So, you know, that may be coming out sooner than later, depending on how many developers get on board and pick that up. And the last little Amazon tip that I want to I wanna share with you. And I just found this out today by looking at a website that was listing Amazon Echo Easter eggs, of all things, right? Uh, the little hidden phrases, kind of like beam me up Scotty and things like that. There's a ton of them out there. They're fun, but I didn't know this before. And you may have noticed this before and it just me being late to the game on it, but Alexa can give you heads or tails or a random number between X and Y. So you could say, all right, we're going to have pizza tonight. If it's heads tacos tonight, if it's tails, Alexa heads or tails, Boom, she'll give you an answer. And it's pretty random, as much as a computer random generation can be, but there you go. And you can even get mad about it and go, best two out of three. She'll give you a couple of extra answers. So, um, heads or tails. And then you can do, I'm guessing a number. I'm thinking of a number between one and ten. Seven and 356. What's, what's your guess is? You don't believe me? Well, let's have Alexa pick it up. Alexa... Random number between 1 and 10. She'll give you a random number. Anybody got it? Dang, let's try again. You know, those are just some fun tidbits that you can do with Alexa. It's, I've, I found it today, so I wanted to throw it in. Maybe you haven't realized that. Or maybe you're sitting next to Alexa right now, and you're asking her, hey, heads or tails? All right. 1 through 7. All right. Maybe ask her this. Hey, Alexa. Heads I leave some podcast reviews on iTunes for Smart Home HQ. Tails, I don't. Man, I hope she says heads. <laughs> well, that was a lot of information for everybody uh, this week. Uh, wow, I'm just so impressed with the Smart Things new news that has come out and the integration between Smart Things and Alexa. It's really entertaining. It's really interesting and a, and a whole lot of fun. And I was just kidding about the whole podcast reviews. No, not really. Can you guys... Uh, take some time, uh, head over to uh, iTunes and leave some reviews. If you're on Android, I guess it really doesn't matter if you uh, go to iTunes or not, right? Because it's not integrated with you. But you could go to the uh, the show notes or send me an email and just let me know how you feel about it. That's cool, too. Feedback at smarthomehq.net. If you want to leave a voice message for me to play back on the show, smarthomehq.net slash voicemail. Or look at the banner on the side of the front page. Uh, social media is always an option as well, and there's support pages if you're interested in uh, seeing ways that you can support the podcast. But everybody, I just want to thank you for listening and uh, always participating. And, uh, you know, we're going to take it out from now, and it's time to make your home smarter. Talk to you next time. <laughs>